Senate NRA benefactor member, Sarah Palin. to be here truly it makes me think of that famous speech from Henry V you know the one where young King Henry he bucks up the troops before he leads them into battle because you know that's what I do I quote Shakespeare <laughs> no I'm more likely to say buck up or stay in the truck when we talk about defending our rights but it works and we are a happy few, a band of brothers and sisters. We're fighting the good fight, a fight for the Constitution. This is a fight for the future of freedom. And as Henry said, those who are asleep in their beds, you know who they are, they tend to go by acronyms. CBS, ABC, MSNBC, NYT. Well, one day they will think themselves accursed that they were not in this fight with us. Okay, maybe not MSNBC or New York Times, but you get my point. We are fighting a good fight, and I congratulate you all for it. You are the ones fighting the fight, and we are here to celebrate and preserve not just our Second Amendment freedoms. This is about what kind of people we are and what kind of country we want to be. The struggle to protect our Second Amendment rights is spotlighting once again just how broken Washington is and how many of our leaders who are there, they're there for themselves, they're in it for themselves. Not for the American. Welcome back to our coverage of the 2013 NRA annual meetings in Houston, Texas. Cam Edwards, your host. You'll hear from me later on in the hour. Let's go back into the 2013 NRA ILA Leadership Forum where Sarah Palin is speaking. A mainstream media that tore apart another president for using fleeting images of 9 11 attacks and campaign ads. They're crying that he was exploiting tragedy for political gain. Well, that same media is now the reliable, poodle-skirted cheerleader for a president who writes the book on exploiting tragedy. This president flying in grieving parents on Air Force One, making them backdrops in his perpetual campaign style press events. Now, instead of leaders who offer real solutions, we have leaders who practice the politics of emotion. Now, emotion is a good and a necessary thing, but we have politicians exploiting emotion for their own agenda. And we have well meaning. Oh, well-meaning Americans who are desperate to respond to heartbreak and to tragedy. As I say, emotion is a good and necessary thing. Who among us didn't feel despair, sadness, and that anger, absolute anger after Newtown and Columbine? We could use a bit more emotion, by the way, about what goes on every single day on the streets of cities like Chicago and New York. But here is the thing that Nancy Pelosi and Feinstein and Boxer, what those gals won't tell you, emotion won't make anybody safer. Emotion won't protect the good guy's rights. And emotion is not leadership. The politics of emotion, it's the opposite of leadership. It's the manipulation of the people by the politicians for their own political ends. And it's not just self-serving, it's destructive and it must stop. We 
we have these tragedies like Aurora and immediately the question raised in Washington is well what can we do to limit the freedom of the people but it's the wrong question the question better asked is what can we do to nurture and support a people capable of living in freedom and you won't find that in some places today take New York City the mayor there still bitterly clinging to the notion that government must control the people in all aspects of life of course with all the far left wingers there you knew they'd want to ban guns and even though the mayor and celebrities there protected by their bodyguards who are armed with guns it's the old what's right for thee is uh, not right for me I tell you it, it the mayor there trying to ban the big gulp I last time I saw some of my friends who are here at the NRA convention last time I saw some of them, I was on stage doing a speech using a visual image to make a point about the big gulp ban I took a sip the big old, but you have a visual, it works. Well, now I see that the mayor of New York now wants to ban public displays of legal tobacco products. Can you imagine? I tell you, <laughs> don't make me do it. <laughs> Gotta use a visual. No, but that's funny though. It's funny because Todd's been looking for this all morning. <laughs> no, but a people capable of living in freedom. As usual, the men and the women who created this country and secured our freedom, they have the answer. They wrote our founding documents, our charters of freedom for a moral and a religious people. They understood that a free people must either nurture morality, they lose their freedom. John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Not coincidentally for us here today, you know, Adams wrote that to the officers of the Massachusetts militia when the young republic was on the verge of war with France. He reminded those officers who were charged with leading men armed with guns that the freedoms secured by the young republic take for granted a decent and a civil society. Now my hero, the late Margaret Thatcher, the late great Margaret Thatcher. She understood that codependency of freedom and morality as well. She said, freedom will destroy itself if it is not exercised within some sort of moral framework, some body of shared beliefs, some spiritual heritage that is transmitted through the church, the family, the school. And see, that's what's happening in Washington today. Freedom is destroying itself. We have those who call themselves our leaders they reach for the easy answers instead of asking the hard questions when they seek to violate our Second Amendment rights. Instead of asking those who are hiding behind the First Amendment to act more responsibly, well, when they do that, they're helping freedom destroy itself. When the mainstream media stays silent, when a monstrous mass murder of innocent babies finally goes to trial, they stay silent, they're helping freedom destroy itself. When Hollywood glorifies violence with its movies and underwrites gun grabs with its dollars, it's helping freedom destroy itself. And when all of us, when any of us stand by as the American Family Foundation kind of atrophies, well, we're helping freedom destroy itself. So we have to ask ourselves, are we creating a culture that can live and thrive in freedom? Do we have leaders willing and able to help us nurture such a culture? Or are they willing, even eager, to sacrifice our freedoms instead? 
Now, Second Amendment rights, they're personal to me. As a mom, yeah, that's right, nickname for baby Trig, it's Trigger. My nephew's middle name is Remington. I could go on and on about the connections there. He is the mother of a combat vet. As an independent Alaskan, as a lifetime member of the NRA, and as an American, this fight is about what kind of people we are. I want Trigg to grow up in a country that is exceptional and is still strong and good and decent and free. So what keeps me optimistic keeps us reloading in this fight. What keeps us going in this fight and about this country that I love, I know we love, it's the faces that I see here today and the millions who are with us in spirit how I love you guys. You're in a fight in which the people with the policies they admit won't work are the good guys, and the folks protecting freedom are somehow the bad guys, and yet you don't give up. The Washington establishment sneers at you, and you don't give up. The lamestream media just plain doesn't get you, and you don't give up. You don't retreat. And this is a good fight, and I'm proud to be a part of it, and I'm so honored to be with all of you here today. I cannot think of four and a half million brothers and sisters whom I would rather have on my side. I thank you, NRA. I ask you all to keep the faith, stand up, and fight for our freedoms. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.